Calling all utopians. This is Todd Rundgren. Tassim Sultan. Lily Wilcox. Ralph Shuckett. We're coming to your town. Don't miss us. This spring, Live Nation. Well, it came about in, in a kind of organic way, actually. We didn't realize that it was utopia at the point where we were all like playing, I think, my birthday in Central Park. Right. And, essential, and the core of the band essentially was that band, just put together for that gig. It was the same group of people who had been working on the records. They were working on my records on A Wizard of True Star. And, and uh, some of the records that came after that. So it was sort of organic, you know, we were all working together already. I was feeling like in my solo work, I was not playing as much guitar and I'd spent so much trouble trying to learn how that I figured I needed a context where I would play guitar more and, and sing and songwrite a little bit less. That was the original inception and that was that kind of worked out for everybody because we were all fascinated with, uh, with prog rock and fusion and Mahavishnu Orchestra and all that other stuff. And it gave us all a chance to go crazy and, and you know, work on our chops and, and stuff like that. So it was a great time to do a lot of musical experimentation. We eventually evolved into something that was a little bit more of a pop band and that that gave us a different sort of appeal because we came of age when video was starting to happen. So we did a, had a video studio available to us and we would do a lot of videos and that more characterized us as, we, as the band moved into the 80s. And we got a more of a pop sensibility and started writing about more conventional things. So that I think uh, explains maybe the breadth of the audience. When uh, I first met Kaz and when he first came to play with us, he had you know, pr pretty much no musical resume at all. Couldn't point to a whole lot of stuff that he had done. And he had some obvious proclivities, but, uh, but it was not limited by that. And I had very high expectations of him and let him know about them at the time and the fact that he, despite whatever discouragement he might have felt, you know, overcame that and became what to most people now is the bass player of this band. Willie, it's funny, he was I first met Willie when we were working on War Babies, the uh, Hall & Oates record. I had made the assumption, and maybe um, they had made the assumption, that after the record was finished, he was going to go, go out and play it with them. But it ha so happened at the same time that, um, uh, that Kevin Elman, the original drummer, decided that he was going to go work in the family business and not be a touring musician anymore. And Willie said, that's a gig I'd like to have, you know, because playing with Hall & Oates is an interesting gig. They don't, you know, people don't remember that they played a lot of different kind of music, you know. They yeah, just, War Babies was a very, like, kind of more similar to Utopia <clears throat> style. Yeah, it was sort of moving, you know, <clears throat> Daryl wanted to absorb some other influences. He was very influenced by David Bowie and stuff at the time and, and, and other kind of, like, not necessarily mainstream influences like you would hear in the latter records. So, you know, all of this is going on at the same time in the studio and I've been working with with Willie every day and, you know, and I realized. Also John Siegler, who was the bass player at that time, and I yeah. were pretty tight in terms of, we liked our playing as a rhythm section and stuff and so he so, seemed keen about it. Yeah, and so it seemed almost like, a you know, a transition that you sort of blinked and then suddenly Willie was the new, the new drummer in the band. It wasn't like there had to be any audition or introductions or anything like that. So in that sense, I was already aware of, you know, 
uh, at least part of his capacities as a, as a drummer. There were things that he wanted to do that Hall & Oates did not necessarily afford him the opportunity to, to do. So, And at the time, we didn't realize that Willie was also a budding songwriter because he just never had the opportunity to exercise it. Yeah, with Hall anyway. & Oates, I wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't writing any, contributing anything to Hall & Oates records. So I think, it, you know, we discovered that he actually has um, an ear for a tune as well, you know, which was a great asset to the band. Now, Ralph, Ralph had a lot of history by the time, you know, he came uh, uh, at first to actually work on my record, to work on uh, Wizard. On a Wizard, yeah, first. making, he's on. Sometimes I don't know how to feel and stuff like that, playing little parts in the background. And uh, all of those guys, most all of those guys in the original Utopia band were songwriters or, you know, writers of some degree. Kevin Elman didn't really write anything, but, I mean, you were writing songs. Moogie was writing songs. John Siegler was writing. He wasn't writing all the lead songs, you know, but he was writing music and stuff. So it was a... It was really kind of like, you know, mutual admiration society in that sense because we had all achieved a certain level, you know, in terms of being songwriters and developing our own names as musicians. We used to just kind of come into the studio and everyone would toss their ideas in there or sometimes we would bring ideas, demo ideas or something like that were, which were a little bit more fully realized. And so we never had actually one official way of writing songs. It could be any combination of the guys. But we decided early on that it was, it'd be much easier for us in the long run if we credited all the writing to the whole band because it simplified the, publish, the distribution of the publishing. We had something that almost no other musicians had at the time. We had our own studio, and we had no clock or anything like that, and this characterized a lot of the way the music came out and the methodology that we used for the entire life of the band, which was, you know, not to necessarily guys come in with finished songs, but, you know, we get together in the studio and use the studio as a, as a tool to to hash the stuff out. So that was built in from the very beginning and it characterized the band because not a lot of other bands had the ability to just spend as much time as they wanted in the studio goofing around. Some of it was trying to stay relevant without kind of doing what most everybody else would do. Like um, arena rock started to become a formula and all the records would sound, it would take a certain form and they'd all sound the same way. And if you were willing to do that, you could be really successful, but then you would have the lifespan of an arena rock band, whatever that happens to be. And so we always were trying to find different ways to, to differentiate ourselves. So, like, for instance, an album like Adventures in Utopia, we imagined that we had our own television show uh, called Adventures in Utopia, and we were writing the soundtrack to the TV show. And quite fortunately for us, we had access to a video studio, so we could make videos that kind of fleshed that whole thing out a little bit. Um, and we would bring video on stage very early on and to do special video production just for our stage shows. All of it a way to kind of differentiate ourselves without going the obvious route, you know, up like smoke bombs and... Oh, we we don't, already, we don't mind a smoke bomb or two, but, you know... We, we had already done that anyway. Yeah, we did that already, you know. <laughs> you had a motorcycle... A motorcycle drum set. Yeah, a motorcycle drum set that made me nauseous when it spun <laughs> around. <laughs> Which was the most amazing thing, playing a drum solo while you're spinning around. While you're spinning yeah, the roadies around. would have a great time with that by speeding up the motor so that I, the centrifugal force was so... I had to hold on and play with one hand. 
<laughs> sticks go flying off in the air. Oh, between that and having the sound guy put um, sound effects on the drum so that when you play, you don't even know what it's going to sound like. Yeah, yeah, one world. Whoa, whoa, it's our world. Yeah, yeah, one world. Whoa, whoa, it's our world. There's always issues. You know, the band, we kind of came to the end of what was really the logical, we, you know, we arrived at a, a more or less logical conclusion, at which point the band was no longer satisfying things for certain people in the band. Um, it got harder and harder, you know, to come up with the resources to make the records and to go on the tours and stuff like that, and it almost forced everybody in the band to start looking elsewhere for other things to do. It became something of a burden because everyone was depending on it too much financially and that created a lot of, a lot of pressure to try and be commercial, whatever that is, you know. And the band was never, that was never our purpose. It was never our purpose to just copy what everybody else was doing. And once we got forced into that corner, um, I think everyone realized it was time to go take care of personal business and we didn't know at the time how long that uh, time period that would be, you know, for everyone to kind of get their own um, house in order. Why? Why? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, for, for a, a, a large number of our, our fans, we, we played a, a part of the soundtrack of their lives. You know, they grew up listening to us. They grew up going to the shows. Um, uh, other than um, five dates in, uh, in Japan and one show in California in 1992, we haven't played a concert together since 1986, I think, was the last show that we did as a band, uh, or the last proper tour that we did. Um, so I think that a lot of people are just, you know, they, they, they grew up listening to us. They, they spent a, a majority of their youth around us listening to our records, buying our records, coming to our shows, and I think that like any band that you, that you do that with, you'd like to see them back together again at some point. It just kind of blows my mind at this point, to be honest. <laughs> uh, it, to be honest, that wasn't something that I thought was going to happen. Um, most of my memories for Utopia, you know, are from the past, and so, you know, Todd and Cass have been continuing to tour. Uh, I haven't been touring, you know, recently for or actually for a while. So for me, it's just uh, it's probably just as exciting as it is for the the fans. It's great. It's a uh, you know, it, it's a big part of what my life was for a, a very long time. So it, it, the, the biggest juxtaposition for me is really, you know, in the past I identified myself with being a, a you know, a, a musician and an artist in a full-time capacity. And uh, for about the last, you know, well, 15 years, I've been in the music business. I've still been very active doing, um, you know, television uh, spots and, uh, working as a staff writer for TV. I'm now the senior audio director of a gigantic slot machine corporation. Uh, it's a very, very different headspace. So for me, it's actually very refreshing to get back into, you know, this kind of, for, for me, it's a soulful creative mode. It's more in touch with what I had originally had endeavored to do when I was a kid, what I wanted to become, and really a bigger part of who I am. So it's really getting back to something that I love and also getting back to, you know, playing with the guys that I enjoyed and had a big part of my life with. I've actually played with Ralph more recently than I played with Roger, coincidentally, uh, all about our, you know, some of our previous records and stuff. Uh, the last time I played with Roger, that was the uh, Wizard of True Star recreation that we did and toured for a couple of weeks. And that was when Roger discovered that it isn't like riding a bicycle, you know, you can't stop touring for a long time and then suddenly start doing it again without, you know, kind of getting into a different kind of condition. 
and he realized that just time had taken the taken its toll uh, for him, and he didn't want to tour anymore. You know, he didn't want to have to, um, you know, get that energy up night after night after night after night. You know, and uh, and essentially go back to having no control over your own time anymore, that sort of thing, for as long as you're on the road. Is that so what we're gonna do <laughs> <laughs> night after night after night. We yeah. got the ringers. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, when we finally, you know, f faced the fact, you know, that Roger was uh, was not going to be able to rejoin the band, and you know, there were there was talk about, you know, who else could do it, and of course, the most obvious answer was right there the whole time. Well, within the time constraints, we are going to attempt to uh, to cover most all of the uh, significant moments that people would uh, complain about if we didn't. <laughs> so uh, we have a list of songs. It's not the official set list yet, but a list of songs that we're pretty confident people would like to hear or expect to hear. And now we've got to kind of knead that into shape so that it's actually a show. Like I, like I mentioned, this is a pretty broad palette that we're dealing with. And so we're trying to um, break the show up logically, you know, give everyone that sort of grand feeling of the original Utopia days and then some of the more sort of tight, hard rocking sometimes and ballad singing sometimes. Um, unit of the of the latter day. So it, there, in the actual life of the band, there wasn't an actual dividing line. We never like broke up and reformed. But you could say musically, there was a transition in there, which happened probably around rock when we were still pretty prog rock. And then right after that record, we started to be more concise and more songwriting. <laughs> Um, be careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> I think we're go we're going to have a good time. I think we're going to have a good time. I think uh, that you should rest up before you come to the show because we're all not as young as we used to be. And like I say, it's going to we're going to try and cover as much of it as we can. So. You want to make sure that you're well rested before <laughs> this show in order to get through it with us. Um, you got any uh, old leftover, you know, mescaline or something like that? You know, you've been waiting for the time to take it. This might be the time to do it, you know. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, we're coming out on the road in the spring, so don't miss us. See you soon.